Good morning. Thanks for joining us at the First Congregational Church online. Let's pray. Good morning, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this new day. It is the day that you have made for us to enter into. It is the day that you have made for us to know you and to love you and to worship you, that you would equip us and strengthen us, that we would go forth into this week and live more strongly for you. We want to give you glory in our lives. We want to give you praise with our mouths. We want to give you our attention with our ears and just tell you that we love you today. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In your name we gather. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Thank you for joining us for the online ministry of the First Congregational Church of Wyndham. I'm thankful that you can join us on Facebook or on YouTube or on the non-commercial firstcongwyndham.online.church site. Whichever one you're on, please uh, indicate that you are here. I like to be able to see who has come on a Sunday. And I know everybody who is on also appreciates knowing who they're worshiping with and who they're participating with. It's a big encouragement. You might also hit the share button or uh, put a little message, if you're, especially if you're on Facebook, that you're at church here today. It might be an encouragement to uh, someone that you know who is just who's seeking the Lord or uh, seeking to know God better, um, that they could come and we could help them find him. I have just a couple words of announcement uh, this morning. This first word pertains particularly to those who are with us in person on Sundays. And if you are planning to join us in person, we're meeting at 1030 in our fellowship hall this weekend and Father's Day weekend. But the final Sunday of June, June 27th, we move our service ahead a half an hour in person only. Uh, 10 o'clock. Online is going to stay the same all summer long, 1030. So you don't have to worry about that changing. But in person will be at 10 o'clock starting um, June 27th. One of the reasons that I highlight that is because at the end of July, we're going to be going back to the tabernacle for a one Sunday worship time. So Sunday, July 25th, back at the tabernacle at 10 o'clock. The reason for that is that following that service, we would like to have a box lunch social, um, as we did a number of months ago when the fire department came. And following the box lunch social, we want to take advantage of the pond up on the campground and have a baptism service. I have a few individuals who have spoken to me about believers' baptism, and we would like to do it that Sunday, weather permitting. So if you would like more information about that or you would like to come, we just need to know for making boxes of lunch uh, to do that ahead of time. We'll ask for a small donation to help cover the cost of that. It has been a long time since we've really been able to get together largely as a church family, and I invite you to come. It would be a wonderful time to see you all and fellowship together and celebrate the commitment that people make in the act of baptism as they follow Christ. So that is July 25th. I'm telling you now so that you have a number of weeks to uh, make our recording plans. Our mission for the month of June is uh, the ministry of John Vampatella. I have been saying with Campus Crusade, but more specifically, it's with Athletes in Action. It's the uh, athletic evangelism and discipleship and training ministry of a crew. And so uh, John is serving from Maine out to Buffalo, down to New Jersey, seeking to uh, help athletes coaching staff uh, come to know the Lord and then walk strongly in him and be a good witness for him in their college careers and then uh, as they enter life, whether they continue in sports or not. So all of our June mission giving is designated for that. And to give to that, you do need to designate it. I encourage you to use our online resources. There's a PayPal link on our website as well as Facebook page. And there's also um, the, the link to our Vanco site, very, very easy to give to missions. And it's also very easy to give for your regular tithes and your offerings, uh, a very simple and secure means to be able to continue to support the ministry of the church. And uh, I hope that you will do that. 
This morning, the first passage of scripture that I'm going to read is also the passage that we'll be preaching early later. It's Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 7. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples, in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar. Bring my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and I have made. And then from Paul's letter to the believers in Philippi, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look out not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let you have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Psalm 103, some selections. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all of his benefits who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Bless the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Bless the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. You, his servants, who do his will, bless the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Bless the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, to bless you is what we are called to do. And to bless you is more than appropriate. Because blessing you is a way that we verbally acknowledge your quality, your, your reputation, your attributes, your majesty, your holiness, everything that we worship, everything that we praise you for. 
All of those things lead us to speak that in, in blessing you, in speaking of your quality and exalting you and declaring your worth. And Lord, you express that worth in, in ways that the psalmist has spoken here in the gift of forgiveness and as you heal us, as you redeem us from, from darkness and death, as you give us and fill us with your love and your compassion, you strengthen us that we might be strong as youth, even in our older years. Lord, all good gifts that we receive have come down from the Father of glory, the Father of light, in whom there is no change and no shifting shadows, that you would be one way in the morning and another way in the afternoon. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And those things, Lord, call forth from us praise. They call from us the, the description of you as a good and mighty God. And we're so privileged and so thankful to know you. Lord, this psalm goes on to highlight the expanse of your mercy. The compassion as a father who looks down on us and knows us and sees our frame. You know our weaknesses. You know our human frailness. You know our tendency to sin and to turn away from you and to ignore you, to, to run away from you. But Lord, your heart is so forgiving that when we come, when we come and we repent, when we come and we talk to you and, and we ask for your forgiveness, your love is such that you do. Your love is as high as the heavens are above the earth. And, and, I, and I love that phrase, as far as the east is from the west. I think of the song, I think it's by Casting Crowns, where it talks about forgiveness. And the, the, the line that says, how far is the east from the west? And then they answer it by saying, one scarred hand to another. The sin that is forgiven by the gift of Jesus' death on the cross for us. That is really the measure of your love because you did that for us before we, before we even sought it. You did that for us in our most desperate need. And you invite us day by day to the forgiveness that you give to us in Christ. Oh Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, one of the things that we have been praying about in, in different venues has been our adult children. Some of us have adult children who are walking faithfully with you, and we pray for them that you would strengthen them in their lives, especially as they would seek to raise their children to know you. It is such a challenge in culture to do that. And so we want to pray for our adult children who are walking with you, that you would encourage them even today that you would pour out your presence and your blessing in a rich way that strengthens them. But Lord, some of us would have adult children that we know have turned away. They may not be antagonistic toward you, but they don't really pay attention anymore. And sadly, there are some who have become antagonistic to you for, for whatever different reasons. Lord, this morning, we want to lift them up to you that they would remember that the God that we have been extolling and, and praying to is the same God whom they could come back to know again, the same one that they could turn to, the same one who loves to forgive. And so we want to pray for them this morning. And as we pause for a moment of quiet prayer, um, let us think specifically of those adult children and, and grandchildren and other people in our lives, maybe parents, maybe spouses, maybe brothers or sisters and friends, co-workers, whom we very much want to see come to know you. We pray for them now. We lift them up by name and our hearts to you. Lord, would you draw them back to yourself? Hear us as we pray now.
Lord Jesus, you know each name, you know each person, you know each life situation, and you know the kinds of things that will help shine your light upon them and to them that they would respond to. They've already received a lot of light. Lord, would you open their hearts to that which they've already seen. Show them more that will help them as they would come home. And we will thank you for that, and we will rejoice in that. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be thinking together about Isaiah 43. I'm not going to reread the passage, but you might like to have your scripture open um, to that. There is a, a new drama series that is being created. It's a multi-season series. It is called The Chosen, and it is a telling of the story of Christ. And the, the opening scene of the very, of the very first episode uh, takes us back in history to the family of a young girl uh, in the village of Magdala. And this, at one particular night, the father is sitting outside the uh, family tent, and this young girl is terrified. She's very afraid, and apparently this happens with some frequency. So she comes and she sits by her father, and they look up at the night sky, and on this particular night, there is a brilliant star that they don't remember seeing before. Father asks his little girl, why are you so afraid? Well, she doesn't know. And then he says, well, what do we do when we're afraid? And she says, we say the words. Well, what words? We say the words from Isaiah. The father starts and then he says, but I want to hear you say them also. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And every time they share that, her fears calm and she's able to go back to sleep. Well, fast forward 30 years and at the end of this first episode of The Chosen, this little girl who is named Mary has uh, grown up, as have all of Mary's fears, all of Mary's sin, all of her suffering at the hands of the demons that uh, have come into her life. And, and no one can do a thing. No one is able to bring any relief to her life at all. And many have tried. One desperate night, one desperate night, she meets and turns away from and uh, tries to escape a, a particular man who makes her feel very, very uncomfortable. And as she's walking away and he's very slowly following her, he calls out, Mary, Mary of Magdala. And she stops. And she turns slowly and she looks at him. Who are you? How do you know my name? And the one that she will eventually come to know is Jesus says this. Thus says the Lord who created you and he who formed you. Fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. And drawing near to her, he puts his hands on her head. He doesn't say anything that we can hear, but probably he's praying inside and you see her body change and everything changes as those demons that had been possessing her are cast out. The demons leave and her fears leave and her life changes. And Mary, whom you and I know from the Gospels as Mary Magdalene, is made new. A fictitious account? Certainly. A backstory possible, you know, maybe. But the promise from Isaiah 43 is really the premise of the chosen. And certainly it underlies all that Jesus did in his ministry. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. Isaiah 43 has a specific context. It is the context of the people of Israel in exile. After their centuries of rejecting God, God finally evicted them from their land, and they would have 70 years under Babylonian rule and Chaldean rule together, Babylonian and, uh, and then, um, yeah, Persia um, together before the Lord would bring them back. 
But the promise was that the Lord would, in fact, bring them back. He had not given up on them. Rather, he said, Jacob, you're still my Jacob. I, Israel, you're still my Israel. I redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And that promise that he made to Israel, I apply as a beautiful promise to believers today. I think it is so relevant to you and I as believers in our lives today. This passage of Israel's promised restoration is a beautiful picture of the Lord's work and his plan. God is the maker and we are the made. God is the seeker and we are the sought. God is the redeemer. We are the redeemed. God is the caller. We are the called. God goes first. God always goes first. God is the beginning and all things begin in him and have their beginning. Even Jacob, Israel, as the people of God, had his beginning in the Lord. Yahweh, who created Jacob, who made the family that would become Israel. And as you think about that event that, that began, oh, almost 2,000 years before Jesus, and then coming to the 8th century B.C., uh, Israel hadn't even been, Judah hadn't even been kicked out of the land yet, but Isaiah is looking ahead to a time in the 500s when Israel would be coming home and God would be fulfilling his love and his promise and his relationship with his people. Thus says the Lord, he created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. God did not abandon Israel, even though they had done so much to abandon him. He was faithful to them in his purpose and in his relationship. But the verse that speaks most strongly to my heart is uh, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flame will not consume you. This whole section is a passage that I will frequently read with someone who is in the hospital or in the nursing home, or if I'm visiting them at home and I'm knowing that they're going through some specifically difficult things. I love to read this passage because it speaks of the power and the faithfulness of the Lord. Um, God makes a promise to them. And, and so what's interesting in this is that God does not say he's going to protect us from all of the different things that are going to happen. He, he, says, he says, when you pass through the waters, when you walk through the rivers, when you go through the fire. He doesn't say if, he says when. And then he goes on to say, they don't have the final word. They're not going to hurt you because I'm with you. They won't destroy you because I'm with you. They are on a leash and that's my leash. And I have control over those things. And what I have found over the years is that when someone is facing a particularly difficult um, uncertainty in the hospital or the nursing home time gets very, very long and weary, or some decisions are needing to be made and, and things are hard in life. This promise that even though we're going to go through those times, they're not going to win. That is God's absolute promise. He says it three times. And when God says something three times, we need to pay attention because he really means it. I think of a picture in the New Testament that to me illustrates this very well. In Luke 22, 31, that's the beginning of the passage where Jesus tells Peter that he's going to deny him three times. But Luke alone includes a little snippet of conversation that the other three do not. And he says, Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. I don't know exactly what that means, but that doesn't sound very happy. I, I don't think that I would like to hear that somebody was going to do that to me. And I can just imagine the, the things going through Peter's mind as he hears Jesus say that. And, and Peter's likely thinking, and you said, no, right? I mean, you're not going to let anything like that happen. But Jesus goes on and said, but I've prayed for you. that after you have fallen, you will turn and you will strengthen your brothers. Peter, you're going to walk through the fire. 
Peter, you're going to go through the waters, but they will not overwhelm you. They will not burn you. They will not destroy you. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, talks about a time when he was caught up to heaven in an amazing vision of glory. Some people think that it was the time when he was stoned outside of Lystra on his first missionary journey. And it says that they left him for dead. And, and perhaps he did come so close to dying because the time frame seems to fit. And that perhaps he had a vision of the heaven, of heavens where you know where God is. But, but God didn't want him to become conceited or vain or boastful or proud or anything about that. So he says in uh, chapter 12, beginning with verse 7, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. And God said, no, three times. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. One of the tragedies that people bring in trying to make people feel good is the idea that somehow if we just have enough faith, we can eliminate our illnesses. We can, if we just have enough faith, we can change those things. And Unfortunately, I, I have heard of people who are told that, well, the reason that you're not healed is because you just don't believe enough. And my heart really grieves in that because God never promised to heal everybody. Jesus didn't heal everybody when he was alive. The, the apostles at the beginning of Acts, they didn't heal everybody. They healed some, and that was a beautiful thing. That was very, very strong and, and a very, very powerful testimony. But there's never been a time when everybody was healed. And this passage from Paul tells me that if you are praying and you are seeking God's healing in your life and it does not come, don't heap guilt on yourself. Don't accuse yourself of not having enough faith. Don't accuse yourself of doing something that has displeased God. God's plan may simply be no. You know, there are three answers to our prayers. Sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says wait, and sometimes God says no. And it's not a measure of our faithfulness or faithlessness. It's a measure of his plan. I focus on that because of the promise that Paul writes for us in Romans 8, 28. For God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean that God makes everything be good. It doesn't make, mean that God makes everything feel happy. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is that God takes the good things, he takes the non-discriminate things, he takes the pain, he takes the sorrows, and all of them are stirred together in his ingredients and in his plan, and the end result is his work in our lives, which is really ultimately to make us like Jesus. And so he would use the blessings in our life to shape us to be like Jesus, he would use just the random days, the, the days when nothing particular is happening to help strengthen us and make us like Jesus. He will use the most painful, sorrowful, difficult, long, enduring experiences as a part of his plan to make us like Jesus. And truth be told, sometimes he can only do things through difficult things. It's through the difficult things he can do more sometimes than even through the good. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago the idea of COVID and how there have been blessings and positive things and growth things and good things that have only come because COVID was here. They would not have happened in the same way if COVID were not here. 
We spent a little bit of time on Thursday, a Bible study talking about that. I offer to you again, think about that in your life. What is one or two things in your own life that over these last 14 months, if it were not for COVID, you would have not known this blessing from the Lord? If it were not for something related to the issues of COVID, you would not have grown in this way or you would not have been strengthened this way because God has the power to conform those things. He has the power to make those things conform to his will for our good ultimately, that we will be shaped to be like Jesus. As I read Isaiah 43, 2, that's an Old Testament example of these New Testament principles. When you pass through the waters, you're going to pass through the waters. I'm going to be with you. When you go through the rivers, you won't drown. They will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And then he gives the very specific definition of why. Verse 3, because I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, and as Yahweh, I am your God. I am the Holy One of Israel, and I am your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. You are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. The Lord identifies himself with the historic name that he has shared with his people from the very beginning. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and especially Moses, when the Lord introduced himself and defined his name, I am. I am who I am. I am that I am. It is the same one, changeless, eternal, who was with Abraham, who was with Isaac, who was with Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and David and Daniel and the prophets. And he is the same one who is with you. He's the same one who is with me. And as he says his name, I am Yahweh, your God, you can think of it saying that all that I am in myself, all that I am as Yahweh, I am on your behalf. I am for you. I am invested in you. I am the Holy One who leads Israel. I am your Savior. One of the songs that I really appreciated through the Christmas season was a song about salvation is in your name. Salvation is in your name. Salvation is your name, actually. And as you finally go through it, he changes it, not just salvation is your name, but then he says Yeshua is your name because the word salvation and the name Jesus or Yeshua in the New Testament is God saves. Yeshua, salvation. Jesus is God's name, and that name is for us. That name is with us. Because, verse 4, you are precious in my eyes, you are honored, and I love you. To say that we are precious in God's eyes means the value that he has. Whatever you hold precious, you treasure dearly. It is very, very important to you. You love it greatly. What is honored has dignity and esteem and respect and a place of, of, of importance. And then he says, I love you. I love you. And that means I'm committed to you. I have made a covenant with you. I have made a promise with you. I will not break my love. I am committed to my resources being for you and to doing the good for you. Even when you don't do the good back, I am committed to you. I am love you. As I read this passage, I think of other people whom God knew. And I think of other people whom God called. God called them by their very own names. In Genesis 16 and Genesis 21, the very first examples in the Bible of God calling someone by name, that's not who you might think. Um, it's not Abraham or Sarah or Noah. It's uh, Hagar, Sarah's slave, who becomes pregnant with uh, Abraham's first child. And that leads to a lot of complications. And the first time, Hagar just wants to run away. And when the Lord meets her, he calls her by name, Hagar. Hagar, what's the matter? 
Well, after Isaac is finally born and Hagar's son Ishmael is taunting him and ridiculing him, and this time Sarah actually sends her away and she's not going to come back. Genesis 21, she's ready to die because the, the journey is getting very hard and the Lord comes to her and he calls her by name, Hagar. The Lord saw her, the Lord knew her from afar, the Lord knew what her need was, the hurt and the ache in her heart, and he came and he called her by name. The next is Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Moses had lived his 40 years as a prince in Egypt, and then you know the situation by which he left and he went off to Sinai, and he was shepherding the flock of his uh, father-in-law Jethro. And one day there's a burning bush and Moses comes over to look at the burning bush and the Lord speaks out to him, Moses, Moses. And the relationship that changes history begins because God meets Moses on the backside of the wilderness and he calls him by name. In 1 Samuel 3, the young boy Samuel is serving Eli the priest and he hears his name over and over again at night, Samuel. Samuel, as the father, the God introduces himself to Samuel. Elijah, after he had his victory with the prophets of Baal, but he is so worn out and depressed, he goes off to the wilderness and he wants to die. And God meets him and calls out to him, Elijah. In Mark chapter 2, as Jesus is walking by a tax collector's booth, he turns and he says, Levi, son of Alphaeus, come follow me. And then in Luke chapter 19, verse 5, he's walking into a village and he looks up in a tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming to your house. It's interesting. I hadn't thought of this until just right now, but two of the people whom Jesus calls by name were tax collectors. That tells us something about the love and the, and the compassion of Jesus third individual in the New Testament is probably the most powerful to us, and that is in Acts 9. When, when Saul is riding the horse to Damascus and he's persecuting Christians, and the light shines and it knocks Saul off of his horse and he's blind, and Saul hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In all of these instances, it is evidence that God knows each of these individuals. He knows each of them by name. He knows where they are when he wants to find them. He knows their lives. He knows their hopes, their convictions, their fears, their sin. And he also knows what he wants to do for them and what he wants to do in them. Friends, the encouragement that I take from Isaiah 43 as he says to this, I have called you by name and you are mine. Friends, he knows your name. He knows who you are. It's like if you're walking through a crowded airport, you're meeting somebody, but you're not even sure where they are. And it's very crowded and you can't see. And all of a sudden you hear it very faintly. You hear your name. You hear your name and it is really, it's for you. And you know, and you're listening, it, the same, the Lord is calling out to you. If this were a different circumstance, I think of all of the names that I see on Facebook and on YouTube, your people who make comments or you indicate your reactions to uh, what the program is, is doing that particular day. I would sit and I would just say each of your names. You know, the Lord knows your name. He knows you. He knows where you are. Those of you who are here in Wyndham, some of you are in, in uh, Florida, some of you are in Maine, some of you are in New Hampshire, some of you are in other places that, I, that I'm not aware of. But God knows your name. And in knowing your name, he knows your life. And he calls you because he's interested in relationship with you. And he calls you by your name that you may also be called by his name. The last verse in the passage that we read is from verse seven. Everyone who is called by my name, my created for my glory, whom I formed and whom I made. When I think of being called by someone's name, a couple of different pictures come to mind. 
if you went to a university that had a big football team or basketball team and you identify with the mascot, you might be called a Husky or uh, where my kids were born, you might be called a Badger or you know any one of a number of different animals or, or mascots. Or perhaps you're called by your locale. Perhaps you know, you're called a New Yorker or you are called, I don't know, an Ohio and a Buckeye or, or a Wolverine. Um, or maybe you're called by your employee. My dad was a company of IBMers you know, when I was growing up because he was identified with that particular organization. To be called by that name associates with you with that name and, and all that that name represents. Perhaps the picture of adoption is even better because where it's where a parents take a child and they invite that child into their family, but not just as a guest, but as someone who actually belongs to them. And so they adopt them and that child now has their name. And when they have the name, they have an identity. They have a family, they have a life, they have a provision, they have an inheritance. Something dramatically changes when they are now called by the name of their parents. The scripture talks to us about being called by God's name. It means that we are marked as belonging to his. It's, it's like a stamp of belonging or a seal of ownership. If we're called by his name, it means we're under his protection. It means we're equipped with his equipping. It means that he seeks us out. He puts his name on us that we belong to him. That we belong to him. In the book of Acts, two times, Acts 8.16 and 19.5, it talks about how the believers were baptized into the name of Christ. It's the only time in Scripture that that particular phrase is used. Often we hear you're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit or baptized in Jesus' name. This particular time is you're baptized into the name of Jesus. Well, when the Spirit comes upon us, he does the work inside to make us the Lord's. But when we are baptized into the name of Christ, that is, that is our identification, if you will. It means I am attaching myself to Jesus. I am affiliating myself with him. I am intentionally taking his name upon me. And that is the name that we read about in Philippians the name above every name, that at, the, that at the name of Jesus, every tongue in heaven and on earth, every knee in heaven and on earth should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Be called by God's name means that he is investing in you and now he wants to display his glory in you. His mercy to forgive our sin, his protection of our life, his strength that we would walk with him day by day, his ability to make us brand new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has come. And so each individual who is called by God by name, and then called by Jesus' name, is called into a situation where he is on our behalf. He works for us and he strengthens us. Friends, Jesus knows you today. He knows your name. He knows your given name. He knows your nickname. He, he knows all of those things. Whether you are like Saul or Matthew or, or Hager, who did not know him at all, he knows your name, and I would believe he calls out to you today that you might know him. Or maybe you are Elijah, and you have walked with the Lord for a long time, and you've served him, and you've been active, but you're in a very tired and weary place as Elijah was. Or maybe you're Peter, or maybe you're like Paul. He knows you. He knows where you are. He knows who you are. Friends, as he calls you by name and as he calls you by his own name, 
I believe that he invites you and me to follow him still. Wherever you are on your journey, whether you haven't even begun yet or whether you're just beginning or whether you're relatively young or whether you've been walking with the Lord for a long, long time, he invites you to come to him. He invites each and every one of us to admit our need, to admit the sin in our lives that has created the need for a savior, to agree with God about what he already knows, And as we admit our sin before him, to believe that God has done what we needed to deal with that sin, that that Jesus Christ is Savior. And because he is Savior, we can know him as our Lord. He died on the cross to pay the sin debt that we owed God. You know, I've heard people, and we've talked, I've talked with a couple of people recently about the major difference between Christianity and all other world religions. All other world religions that are human creations are about what I need to try to do to get on the good side of God, what I need to do to get in with him. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is not about what I can do. I've already done all that I can do, and that's create the need. Christianity is about what Jesus has done. And all God desires is that you and I place our faith in what Jesus has done. And as we believe that, we receive him. As John said in John 1, 12, he has, well, I'm going to have to turn there now. I, I, I had it, but I'm going to actually need to turn there. And three to everyone who receives him, who believes in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Mm-hmm. And upon admitting our need, And upon believing him, the most important thing that we do is that we confess that to others. We tell other people the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. We don't hide it. We we don't make it a secret. We own it. We speak it. That Jesus Christ is our Lord. We become God's child and we inherit God's family name. Now we have the privilege of living for him. A few episodes into The Chosen, after Mary has uh, been healed and a few other individuals see it, but they have no explanation for it. Mary, at this point in this narrative, still doesn't even know who it is who did it. And uh, the character that represents Nicodemus uh, has a conversation with her. And Mary's response is this. I used to be one way. And now I'm different. And the thing that happened in between was him. Friends, Jesus knows your name today. He knows the circumstances of your life. He calls you by name. So that as you respond to him, then he can call you by his name. And friends, That's life. Let's pray. Lord, it's humbling. It may even be a little scary to think of how completely you know us. There is no place that we can hide that you don't find us. There is no thing going on in our life that you are not aware of and see. There is no pain so deep, no no sorrow so dark. There is no joy so great, but that you that you know it, Lord. And as you as you met Mary, whatever it actually looked like in her life, as you met your disciples, as you met Moses and Hagar, as you met Daniel, as you met Saul, you would call to us that we might walk with you. And as we walk with you, we experience not just your calling us by name, but calling us by your name. A new belonging, a new hope, a new reality, a new life, a, a life that is just beginning until that time when we come be with you. Lord, would you would you strengthen us 
that we might be encouraged in those words from Isaiah as we go through struggles that this would give us a hope. This would give us strength, give us determination. For you said you will not fail us or forsake us, but you're with us and we will not be overcome. Thank you for that today. Thank you for your good gifts. We pray in your most holy name. Well, friends, thank you for joining us this morning. May you experience the confidence of knowing that Jesus knows you, even calls you today by your very own name. He might interact with you that, that you might know him. And knowing him, that he would call you by his own name, that he includes you in his life, and who he is and all that he has for you. Um, and friends, that, that is true joy. God bless you today and strengthen you throughout this coming week. Bye.